Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of our exciting um, interrogation of futures of histories of a future environmental catastrophe. And um, I would like to open the morning session uh, by inviting Professor Gulhan Balsoy, who uh, came from Istanbul to speak with us. Uh, Gulhan is an associate professor of history at Istanbul Bilgi University, at the history department. She received her PhD at Binghamton University, in New York. She spent a year in Berlin as a postdoctoral researcher at the UMI project, Europe in the Middle East, the Middle East in Europe. Um, she's also the author of The Politics of Reproduction in Ottoman Society, 1838-1900, uh, out with Routledge 2013. A Turkish translation of this book, Kahraman Doktor Ihtiyar Ajuziye Karshi, has won the 2016 Yunus Nadi Social, Science, Social Sciences and Research Award. Uh, some of her significant publications include Haseki Women's Hospital and the, uh, of, and the Female Destitute of 19th Century Istanbul, and Infanticide in 19th Century Ottoman Society, published in Middle Eastern Studies, and Gendering Ottoman Labor History, uh, the Jibali Regi Factory in the early 20th century, published in International Review of Social History. Dr. Balsoy's research interests include late Ottoman social history, history of women and gender, and history of medicine. Currently, she is working on a research project uh, that uh, is relevant to us all uh, on the social history of death in late Ottoman Empire. So, Gulhan, please. Thank you, thank you very much, Avner and Om, for inviting me. It's really, uh, I'm very happy to be here and part of this uh, workshop that helped me to learn a lot as well. Uh, so, uh, again, I was worried that my title is a little bit too specific, <laughs> but it's also a learning process. I understood it here, uh, so I will try to see whether I can speak late enough or not. Anyway, uh, so um, I'm not uh, sure about here, but Handmaid's Tale, a wet and TV drama based on Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel, has been one of the most popular shows in many different countries in the past few years, including Turkey. There was, in the last year, there was, everybody was watching Handmaid's Tale and talking about that. And that story takes us to a world where fertility rates have collapsed as a result of environmental pollution, sexually transmitted diseases, and immorality. And after a civil war, a theocratic government, Gilead, has established rule. The world of Gilead is a totalitarian one with strict social, class, and gender hierarchies. Surveillance is the core of the political rule, and women are inferior and subordinate to men. Since the fertility rates have sharply declined, the low number of women who still are able to conceive and give birth are reduced to a sex slave-like status. They were forced to serve as handmaids to men having high power positions. If they conceived, their babies are taken from them and then given to the legal wife of the father. If not, they were sent to forced work to clean nuclear waste where they wouldn't be able to survive for long. Margaret Atwood had written this novel in 18, uh, 1985 in a context of rising political power of Christian fundamentalists, environmental concerns, and attacks on women's reproductive rights, mainly in the US. Since then, the concerns that gave way to this speculative novel have not diminished, but on the contrary, became more acute. And I believe it's partly the same concerns that brought us together here today. Uh, Margaret Atwood defines her novel as a speculative novel, so that's why I thought that it would be appropriate for me to start with that novel. In, a, in an interview, Atwood said that some of the ideas in the novel come from real examples of pronatalism. One example is the policies to increase, increase female birth rates in Ceausescu's Romania, which were based on the policing of female pregnant women and the banning of uh, abortion and birth control. 
The idea of giving the offspring to lower, lower classes to the ruling class came from Argentina, Edward says. After the military junta seized power in 1976, up to 500 children whose parents have disappeared uh, were placed uh, with selected leaders' houses. Moreover, the year when Edward was writing the novel, U.S. pronatalists were bombing and setting fire to abortion clinics. U.S. Medicaid had ceased to fund legal abortions, and several states passed laws rest restricting legal abortion, as well as providing abortion information. In Canada, where Atwood is from, the country's most outspoken abortion advocate at the time, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, had been charged yet another time with performing abortions outside the restriction of the Criminal Code of Canada. Edward says that it was this climate that made her imagine a world where maternity is so tightly li linked with state oppression. In Edward's ultra-patriarchal glad, handmaids are reduced to their uteruses and forced to offer their bodies as vessels for conception and childbearing. Yet, glad is not alone or unthinkable of in terms of the control of women's sexuality, body, and reproductive functions. We know many examples of the ways ancient and contemporary powers try to control maternity. But yet we also know that the modern state, as a relatively recent political structure, had developed more diffuse and complicated mechanisms to control sexuality and reproduction. And in the next part of my presentation, I will try to take us from Edward's dystopic world to the 19th century Ottoman world and then to the pronatalist policies of the modern Turkey, uh, two contexts where concerns over population were expressed through a vocabulary of control uh, over motherhood and child rearing. In the Ottoman case that I work on, uh, the state control on women's reproduction dates uh, back to mid-19th century, to 1838, to be more specific. In the like, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multi-cultural Ottoman world, Reproductive decisions were shaped predominantly by one's fate or denomination up until mid-19th century. In 1838, however, the first state document banning abortion as a worldly issue was uh, promulgated. Uh, this date is kind of familiar to those who know the field. It was just one year before the promulgation of the famous 1839 uh, Tanzimat Rescript, which announced a change in like tax collection methods, legal system, and which is considered a signpost of the transformation of the state society relationship. Uh, with the transformations it announced, the Tanzimat Rescript has been considered the symbol of the formation of the modern Ottoman state. And I think the overlap of the changes in the nature of the state and the initiation of state pronatalism is not a mere coincidence. On the contrary, modern state power reveals itself also through, the inter through its intervention to the most intimate spheres uh, or intimate lives of peoples. I argued in my previous work that Ottoman pronatalism was formulated through three registers, uh, professionalization of midwifery, bans on abortion, and the medicalization of uh, pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, the first step uh, to decrease maternal mortality rates and increase childbirth rates was the transformation of medical services at birth in the Ottoman case. Uh, for this purpose, a midwifery school was established in 1842. Although the education in the school failed in a short time, the Ottoman state increasingly sought to license midwives and regulate their activities. And being licensed became the main marker of difference and main source of opposition as hierarchy and uh, opposition among the midwives. Uh, being licensed, uh, there was kind of, for example, as opposed to the Western or Anglo-Saxon cases, the main opposition was not between the doctors and midwives, but be uh, between the licensed and unlicensed midwives. Uh, the policies to ban abortion uh, was another major venue of Ottoman pronatalism. Uh, while Ottoman authorities were trying to implement policies to improve health standards at childbirth, they also sought ways to decrease abortions, which they believed was one of the main sources of the shrinking population. 
An anti-abortion campaign, which stretched over a few decades, was carried out on discursive, legal, and everyday policy levels. And the examination of the anti-abortion campaign reveals that population policies of the 19th century were framed by gender and led to the politicization of uh, female sexuality. Uh, pronatal policies sometimes held women responsible for, for the low rate of population growth, sometimes asked them to bear and tend children for the well-being of the country, but always invoked assumptions about femininity and uh, what the ideal woman was like. And giving, giving birth was seen as a humanitarian and national duty while abortion was associated with murder. Uh, Health care during pre pregnancy also received the attention of the medical doctors. They maintained that a healthy pregnancy was the precondition of having safe childbirth and raising healthy children. Uh, in order to draw wider attention to the importance of proper health care during gestation, they expressed, the doctors expressed their ideas by publishing advice books targeting pregnant women. Uh, the prescriptive rit literature on pregnancy conceptualized this important female exper experience as a medical event that should be checked and controlled by the experts. Uh, the normative sources uh, redefined the female body as a maternal body, and they advocated disciplining this body in the light of the prescriptions uh, defined by uh, medical doctors. Along with the medicalization of pregnancy, the situation of those women who failed to conceive or experience pregnancy was also problematized. Uh, Ottoman intellectuals and medical doctors saw infertility as the final factor hindering their goal to promote population increase and sought ways to cure it. Uh, although we don't have adequate documents uh, or registers to predict the population increase rates for the 19th century, Cem Behar and Ellen Duban's classic work on Ottoman family uh, structure suggests that birth rates slightly increased throughout this period. Uh, we also know that like factors such as better sanitation, enhanced public health services, widespread vaccination uh, positively affected the population increase rate throughout the 19th century and early 20th century. Yet despite these factors promoting the welfare of the extant population and pulling the average life expectancy a few years up, Ottoman state had undergone significant population loss uh, during that time, mainly due to wars territorial losses, and migration movements. The population, which was estimated to be somewhere between 25 and 32 million in 1830s, was around only 19 million in 1923, when the Turkish Republic was founded. Uh, the new republic had a strong aspiration to restore the population figures by promoting increasing prom population growth rates and decreasing the maternal and infant death rates. Uh, and although the Turkish Republic claimed a radical break from Ottoman methods of governing the citizens, management of reproduction, uh, I argue, was one of the few fields where we can observe a, a strong continuity. Uh, for example, the pronatalist policies uh, continued and strictly forbade abortion, disseminating of knowledge on birth control methods, and uh, providing birth control. It was the same doctors and the same experts who also designed the New Republican pronatalist policies. Only in the post-World War II context, uh, Turkey underwent increase of its population and maternity rates for the first time for more than 100 years uh, started to increase, and that is similar to what happened in many parts of the world, actually. Uh, it was part of a global trend. And this period for the Ottoman case was a period of socialization of health services and brought major gains to ever-growing portions of the population in terms of easier and cheaper access to medical facilities, welfare, and social security. Uh, while urbanization, education, and entry to paid work curtailed uh, fertility and childbirth rates, the positive changes in medical standards decreased significantly the maternal and child death rates. The number of maternity clinics per woman, uh, per woman as well as the number of beds, and number of experts in those clinics in started to increase, which promoted uh, higher population increase rates. 
Uh, and the ever first five years development plan announced in 1965 was the first that foresaw that population increase in Turkey was too high and uh, put uh, it aspired to provide family planning services throughout the country. And in 1983, Turkey changed its pronatalist policies with cl clearly antinatalist ones, with the fear that large population would lead the country to poverty and underdevelopment, and seeing population this time as a problem. This policy is uh, kind of changing as well, but I won't uh, continue that much with that. But to summarize what I had presented uh, until this point, from mid-19th century to 1980s, the main problem, uh, first for the Ottoman Empire and then for the Turkish Republic, was the low population density and low population increase rates. And only after 1960s, the population increase rates started to increase, and it was the post-1980 context when Turkey saw high magnitude of population as a problem. Uh, so much for the Ottoman and Turkish policies of reproduction. Uh, but uh, before coming to the population question on a broader level, level, I want to say that like what happened in 19th century and 20th century was uh, very much part of a global trend, and uh, the Ottoman and Turkish case were no exception. Uh, and uh, like pronatal policies were uh, very strong almost everywhere. Uh, but as opposed to the like past two centuries, uh, 19th and 20th century, where the economic and military power of the states uh, were measured with the magnitude of their populations, we also globally have already stepped into a new period where large population is seen is a social and economic and also ecological problem. Uh, if we we'll very briefly, if I re briefly remind you the population figures of our world, there were only one million people on Earth like 10,000 years ago. By 1800, there were one billion, and uh, by 1960, there were three billion people, and there are almost eight billion people today globally. And when, the, when these figures are plotted on a graph, the growth line looks like almost vertical from 1800s onward, like some of the other charts we saw uh, yesterday, like the consumption of coal or other resources. And UN projected that the global po population would, be, would reach uh, 12 billion by uh, 12,000, uh, sorry, um, 2,100. Uh, these uh, large population figures uh, are in many ways linked to the environmental crisis. Uh, higher population means higher consumption of worse resources, more pollution, consumption of more meat, more diseases, more global warming. A Google search uh, with the words climate change and population growth produces, uh, yeah, my recent uh, search produced, uh, 171 million results, which I wasn't able to check, obviously. And there are very different camps uh, worried about the large global population and its hazardous environmental consequences. Some uh, radical sides, which might, we might call neomalthusians, argue that we should all together stop reproducing. Uh, another name for this movement is called Advocacy for Volunteer Human Extinction. And the, those, the, those volunteers argue that overpopulation would lead to forced shortages, famine, and they call for a zero population growth. According to this view, uh, we are already overpopulated almost at uh, 4 billion, so even stopping at two children doesn't make any sense to save our world, and we should altogether stop uh, reproduce. Uh, other milder uh, sites agree that a sustainable population size will be easier to maintain if societies assure women the autonomy and contraceptive means they need to avoid unwanted pregnancies. Many population experts believe that if we improve the health of women and children in the especially developing nations, reduce poverty and infant mortality, increase women's and girls' access to basic human rights such as health care, education, economic opportunity, and educate women about birth control options and ensure access to voluntary family planning services, 
women will choose to limit family size and the uh, uh, solution will come in an easier and smoother way. Although, in principle, I agree with these ideas, uh, with, uh, but there is still something that makes me slightly uncomfortable uh, with the views uh, alerting us toward high population increase rates and their hazardous uh, conclusions. Um, so, Carolyn Mer Merchant, who is uh, one of the first ecofeminist historians, warns us that one problematic aspect of, aspect of climate change discourse is homogenization of humanity into one undifferentiated group. Uh, however, according to her, the vulnerabilities, as like many other things, are distributed unequally to, and she warns us that the vulnerabilities to climate change cut across lines of gender, race, and class. Uh, following uh, Carolyn Mer Merchant's uh, warnings, I want to speculate from this point on and uh, try to find my way. So, in history, uh, diverse yet all male actors have legitimized the, their interventions to female reproductive choices as a necessity of development and progress or common well-being. The male elites and power holders argued that, for example, if the Ottoman Empire or the Turkish Republic want to be a world power, it had to control and manage population in the first place. The reproductive policies designed by exclusively male actors reflected a certain understanding of politics and power. Masculine understanding of power and progress meant that everything, first and foremost the nature itself, could and should be controlled. Uh, female nature, and one of the most natural female biological function, reproduction uh, and childbearing, would also be controlled for the sake of the nation. Professional elites, especially doctors, apparently had no doubt that they knew much better than women themselves. They saw it as their right and duty to tell women about the right age of giving birth, right number of children, and the right way to raise those children. Midwives, who were the main specialists providing women health care during pregnancy and childbirth for centuries, were gradually replaced by the male obstetricians. Female practices of medicine were degraded, and local midwives were increasingly presented as harmful for women's and infants' well-being. In time, female knowledge was almost completely hijacked, and moreover, female voices were totally shut out of history. So, before ending uh, my presentation, I want to ask, what if women had more agency on their own sexuality and bodies? What if it was women who designed reproductive policies? And here, rather than masculine politics um, obsessed with the control of nature and reproduction, uh, could female agency create a ground for more egalitarian reproductive choices and reproductive rights? If female actors could have gained more space or more visibility, would it be ever possible to establish a more diverse and egalitarian democratic structure? Would democratic reproductive choices result in sharing the resources in more sustainable ways? Here, uh, I want to underline that when calling for female politics, I am not simply suggesting replacing the male agents with just uh, female ones or replacing men with women, but rather, I want to ask if we could find and reinstate from history what has been silenced and suppressed as feminine. The historical structures not only subordinated women, but also made this subordination invisible. Both the historical distribution of power between genders and the way knowledge uh, about this inequality is produced adds to the vulnerability of women today. Uh, hence, uh, creating possibilities uh, to empower women is also linked with finding novel ways uh, of writing history. Uh, thank you. <laughs>